think we 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 would be better off doing keeping it as in this form. Okay, it's visible, isn't it, to everyone? Yeah. I want to see what next as well. Right. So oil is estimation yeah. and types of. Uh, data we'll be looking at will be cross-sectional time series and tunnel. We know what they are. Cross-sectional data is uh, data collected at a point in time. So it again across many objects. Yeah. Uh, sorry, again. We went over. The we done this part? Yeah. Okay. And we know time series and tunnel. So done. The other sides, or just yeah. Yes. I think you left early. I guess this was I last week. Yeah, but we couldn't record it obviously, so this will be recording now. Hopefully this will work now. This. Yeah, okay, okay. Now, there are a number of assumptions for the OLS to be um, valid, the OLS estimators to be valid and reliable and unbiased. Uh, we started with the first one where it was, we said the, that the function, the OLS, is linear in parameters. In other words, the x's here are unknown parameters, are betas, not the actual x's. Do you remember this point from last week, yeah? So here, the betas here, these betas, are our unknowns. Beta 1 and beta 2 are the unknowns. The reason is, y is given to us, is in the form of data, x is given to us, yeah? And another unknown is u. We don't know what it is usually. So, so OLS tries to estimate beta 1 and beta 2. Now notice this, this is not linear model, because beta 2, the unknown, one of the unknowns is in the power, is in the exponent, is the exponent of x. And this is not also linear. Although x's do not have any sort of ratios or fractions or the powers, the betas are the ones that we're looking at. These are the unknown variables. So the, the beta 2 times beta 3 is actually creating this a function that is not linear. When you draw this line, draw this on, a, on an xyz uh, plane, you will see that this is not, it's actually, yeah, x, y, z, so this is three variables, beta 1, beta 2, beta 3. This but is bigly. Sorry, if it was beta 1 plus x to the power of beta 2 plus u. Oh, that to the power of beta 2 is not linear. It's still not linear. Still not linear. Anything uh, that is not uh, linear in betas <coughs> is not linear. Okay. So betas shouldn't have squares, shouldn't have exponents, shouldn't so be an exponent themselves, themselves, hmm? they and they shouldn't be multiplied or divided by each other as well. It's like, you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in a math, oh, no, not this one. In calculus, you have this, uh, y equals x squared. This is parabola, right? Mm -hmm. This is now, this is a line, this is linear function, right? Mm -hmm. Now, this is also not linear. In econometrics, in econometrics, we replace these things with betas. So let's say there's data here. Now, you see this is not, for the same reasoning, this function is not linear, which means OLS will not estimate this. OLS will not estimate this data. <coughs> will not work out what the reason, results are. <coughs> Does that make sense now, guys? Yeah. What linear means? Linear in parameters actually means linear in betas. So the betas have to have none of these. Yeah, none of these. So this is this is fine. This bit is fine. So we can have beta 1, x, plus beta 0. Yeah, this is fine. This is linear because the betas don't have anything, don't have any any sort of characteristics that we just mentioned to make them non-linear. There is a there is a there's a range of function functions we call nonlinear estimators. We will use them if we want to calculate betas when the, when the linearity assumption fails. Now, there has to be some variation in the regressors in the sample. Notice this. Beta 2 is basically, can anyone decompose this function, beta 2 equal to something over something? What is the numerator here? In simple words, what's the numerator? It's what does it say? What can you? What do you mean? Hmm? This the numerator is basically the covariance between x and y. Yeah. 
So there has to be some sort of correlation between x and y for the estimated beta to be valid, to, to, to have some meaningful value. Plus, lastly, the important point for this assumption is the denominator. What's the denominator here? So the, the covariance can be seen. It's the variation, isn't it, of x? xi minus x bar means basically we're looking at the deviation of x from its mean and we're just squaring it. What was the variance formula? Do you remember the formula for variance? Uh, sum of x squared minus uh, sum of x squared. Standard deviation? St sum of. It's okay, the summation <coughs> sign, yeah? Yes, yeah, much. So xi x. minus x bar squared over n minus 1. This is sample sample variation. So that was your statistic. So this is standard deviation. If you don't take the square root, this would be just variance. Now, what's important here in this formula is this, this part here. Because n is fixed. Doesn't matter n is big or small. Variance depends really on this part. So, there ha for the, if you go back to this now again, what I want to point out is that if you want beta to be non-zero, your x should really vary fluctuate. There has to be some variation in y. So x, that is possible, that can explain variation in, in, in y. Now graphically, this is what, what it looks like. I'm going to graph this so that it becomes an intuition. I don't want to use up big space, okay. Graphically. This is our y. This is our x, right? Say this is our data points. Right? My mean, say this is my x bar, and this is my sum uh, is y bar. If we just find it zero, we, we should just say that there's no relation between the two parameters. Yes, obviously, this won't be zero usually. At least some value will be there, and the importance here of whether there's a relationship or not is significance of the so if coefficient find, estimate. If we find it zero, we just assume we made a mistake and go to. Oh no, not necessarily. Maybe the data I mean, is the, not the, varying. For data. the exercises. Uh, for the exercises, the because the calculation is based on the data, if you get a zero, that means the data is not varying. The data x's are not varying around its mean, their means. Yeah, so you didn't make a mistake. It's just the data is made up such that. Uh, result is zero. Yeah, so this is our y hat. Yeah, now notice this we can only calculate the uh, alpha here, which is our basically beta one hat. Yeah, if there is some variation of x's around its mean, this is its mean, and x's vary widely. Yeah, we can we can fit the line. Now, look at this case. Now, what can we do with this? You see the intuition. I won't have time to do this in at Queen Mary, basically. And this is our y. So what's the mean? Mean of is somewhere here, right? In the x. Let's say y is somewhere here, y hat. So this is the point that is mean. How can I fit a line here? How can I fit a line? Because. I can put a line here that probably looks fine. This line looks fine as well. And this, this line looks fine. This line looks fine. All y hats are possible, yeah? There is no single way of calculating beta. That's because, because the actual x's, x1, x2, <coughs> x3, up to xn, are all very close, very close to the mean of this value, yeah? So, you would do so there is little variation between the x's. You would do a nonlinear estimation? No, in this case nothing works. Nothing. Because it's just, the variation in x is almost zero. Oh, similar to this one, look at this. This is crucial. I mean this point. So let's say this one here. This is your x. For all y's. You see, as y goes up, x is just one single point. For all x, there is one, for all, for all uh, y, there is only one x value, yeah? So there is no variation in x. What happens now to this formula? Obviously, 
taking away something from itself so subtracting 2 from 2 is basically 0 so you end up having a beta that's not representative yeah so assumption 2 basically means for the OLS to work we have to have some variation in the dependent variables yeah and question one of your test of your final exam will be about these assumptions so you have to state them so they have to be linear write them down X's have to have some variation write them down and if you can graph it to get better mark because we want to see how you how how, how much intuition you have in this uh, in this concepts hmm? so, and of course you will have to explain it yeah uh, you said that there has to be some variation in X's yes in the in the independent variables yeah and obviously you have to have variation in Y as well yeah but does it mean that I thought um, beta 1 and beta um, 2 or beta 0 are the unknowns, not x? Yes, they are the unknowns. X's are the data and we have to some, have some variation to get to calculate the betas. Oh. You see, um, let's go back to this graph again. This is it's easy. Notice this. Here, in this, in this first one, can you see this first one? Oh. I'm trying to locate my cursor. So in this first first line, we can easily get the beta hat because of the gradient is, you know, there's only one line, gradient is alpha, it's fixed here. But with this one here, without the variation, all lines are true. In other words, we can fit any any line and get this, this beta is basically one option. This beta is basically second option and so on and so forth. So there are so, so many different options or possibilities of betas when there is no variation or little variation in excess. And further down the you know lecture now, as we cover this, you will see this then um, Monte Carlo simulation, I'll show you about how important the variation in X will be. Yes? The, the, the interpretation of both cases is a bit different, right? Because in that one you have uh, points that are close to the X, to the Medium, mean. so to the mean, so you don't really know what's happening with the regression. But with the other one, if the x is all the time the same and the y varies, <coughs> exactly. so there, there is exactly. no correlation at all. Exactly. So there is some. So in the in this in this one, that's a good point actually. There is some correlation. You see, you're trying to say there is positive correlation here. As the x goes up, y goes up. Yeah. But in this one, in some cases, some x's are too high, but then their y's are too low. So basically, it confuses the OLS estimator. It doesn't, it's not able to calculate beta, a correlation coefficient. And then here you just know it's not correlated at all? Yeah, there's no correlation here. Obviously, you can see this from your statistics class that this is basically, this, this, this case is zero correlation, this case is positive correlation, and this case is negative correlation, yeah? Yeah, so you could see that this, this, this case is, is basically not useful. You don't have to calculate you don't have to do OLS regression if there is no correlation because the whole point of doing OLS calculation is to see if there is an impact of X on Y. And if there is no correlation, they, they don't impact. They are not associated with each other, so there is no point in doing anything. Yeah? So you need to have an, uh, above all, you need to have a variation in excess. Now, A3, assumption 3, the disturbance term has zero expectation. You just did this in the problem set, right? Remember the problem set you did? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, when you, uh, with the manual problem set, that you all told me that the deviation from the uh, uh, fitted value are equal to almost zero, 0, 0.00, negative 0 0.002 in the problem's first but question. That's what you said last time, right? That in the unexplained error just gets absorbed in the. Yes, they basically the positive deviations cancel the negative ones. That's the idea here. When you sum them up, when you sum the errors, the positive is expected to. Uh, cancel the negative and now however if there is any constant value of that's non-zero value of error it's usually absorbed by the intercept yeah that's why we need to include intercept so that we can achieve expected value of u i is equal zero assumption does this make sense to you guys these assumptions 
are the building blocks of regression analysis. Yeah. So the, another important point is that we include the betas. You see, when you write, when you do the regression analysis, we calculate two unknown parameters. These are beta zero and yeah, guys. The two. So the, the, this is first. This is second. Ah, this is beta 1 now. Now, here, in the first case, where is my cursor? Okay, it's here. In this first case, u is most likely 0. Because any non-zero component of u, the mean component, is captured by beta. It absorbs it. So as a result, they cancel out each other when you sum them up. So this is the mu, mu is zero, basically. So all, all, the, yeah, go on. all the, the intercept captures all the non-zero... Component of errors. Non-zero mean of error. It's best to say non-zero uh, average or mean of error. You see error, if you remember, error is basically uh, spread out around some mu plus some vi. Vi is actually the disturbance term here. Vi is the is the deviation from the mu of the error. Just like every single variable has a mean, errors have means too. So the mean here is basically becomes the new beta zero. So it's in the next slide I'm going to show you what it is. Um, now look at the second equation here. Beta one x plus u. Here there is no beta zero, so u retains its actual mean value. So it may not be the case that expected value of u equal to zero. It may not be because there is this constant mean that doesn't cancel out. This may cancel out. This may become zero. But this is a constant. Remember? This, let me show you with this. You can say u of sorry. Let me show you this. u equals expected value of the component of u, the mean component of u, plus some sort of ei. ei is just the basic error of error of u. So if you open the expectations bracket here, this will be expected value of mu plus the expected value of ei. We know this becomes zero because this is random and they cancel out. There is no uh, mean component here, the need no constant component. But this here is, notice, doesn't have the i, mu i. This is constant. And remember, the rule of expectations with constant c is always c. So expected value of ui is mu. So without the, the point is, without the intercept, we may possibly get a non-zero use, non-zero errors. And when you have non-zero errors, we have an un, uh, the biased estimator. So the beta will be biased. Beta captures some of the effects that could have been captured by beta zero. Yeah, that's why this number becomes, instead of expected 0 0.5, it becomes 0 0.55, for example. That's an unbiased estimator as a result. Does that make sense to you guys? Hmm? Yeah. So I just actually explained you the second second uh, thing as well, just this slide. Yeah, um, This is the same thing as we did before. Now, except that they actually reverse the v, so they, they express the function as a function of v here. This, this is exactly the same as this part here. Anyway. Now, if that's clear, A4, this is easiest one, I hope, is that the variation of U's, variation of errors, so disturbance term ha is homoscedastic. Variation in U's, the errors, is uh, is constant. Do you remember what it means? 
that is spread evenly across. That's spread evenly across all axes. You see the line here. Um, okay, let me draw this as well again. Maybe that brings that back to you. So I think drawing keeps stays in your mind firmly when you draw and practice it. And that's what you are expected to do in the exam as well, mm -hmm. to show that you actually understand. So let's say this is your X, and this is your error. Even, let's say Y, because errors are based on Y. Okay, so this is the fitted value, let's see. You see the distance here is wider than the distance here, is longer than the distance here. So errors do not have constant variance as a result. If we were to see a constant variation, constant variation, so all these dots are there, we fitted the line, we saw y hat, the distance here is the same as the distance here and the same as the distance here. So the distance stays constant C. Here, this is C1, this is another distance C2, there is another one C3. So distance from the mean value to the actual value, so it's another explanation here, uh, doesn't stay constant. What we want to achieve is this. Sigma square u i equal to sigma square u. So notice this, sigma square u doesn't have i, means it's a constant value. It's some number, yeah? <coughs> and here's the uh, actual decomposition of the variation. Sigma squared ui is basically the expected value of the deviation of uis from their mean. And if you just expand this, expand this uh, bracket using the square exponent, you will have this expected value remaining. And if the uis are constant, I mean the distance between the line and the point is constant average, then we expect this to be a constant value. But if the distance is not constant, so in some in this point here, as we further increase our x, the distance is shorter than the distance here. That's a heteroscedastic dispersion. In the, this is called uh, heteroscedasticity of the errors. And in homoscedasticity is the is the one we're looking at. Homo means the same. So homoscedastic variation is the same, while hetero means changing, so variation here is changing, yeah? So this assumption here is basically should hold for the, uh, for the OLS to be reliable. I mean, the, when I say OLS reliable, is the coefficient estimates are reliable. In other words, they are, they are not, there is no better one of them ones that we calculated. Now, if assumption four is doesn't hold, if if in other words, when you run the regression and use, I will I will test I will show you how to test for heteroscedasticity. At the moment, this is conceptual. I'll show you how to do the testing and, and as well at some point. If you come up with the heteroscedasticity that's not homoscedastic, or the variation that's not homoscedastic, then uh, your estimator is not efficient. Efficient means it has wider standard deviation, higher standard deviation. Now, in about five slides time, I think we will, I'll show you what, which one is efficient, what, what, what I mean by uh, estimate is not being efficient. We'll do a Monte Carlo simulation. So for now, let's assume this, let's keep this in mind that uh, the assumption that uh, we're interested is this, Variance of errors is constant, as such, estimators are efficient. Now, 
This oftentimes occurs in uh, time series data, not necessarily in cross-sectional data, but we have to still cover this. The values of the disturbance term do not correlate with each other. So there is no serial correlation between error of today and tomorrow's error, let's say. Value today is not correlated with tomorrow. So they are independent occurrences. They are independent of each other. So this is the covariance here between point I and point J. And we expect them to be independent. So their expected values are equal to zero. Product of their expected values equal to zero. Look at this now here. Um, maybe I'll draw it. This is very short. Once you copy, I'll draw draw a line and show you what, what I mean. I'm trying to say what positive autocorrelation means and negative autocorrelation means. Right, if you go down. So if you have data, that's spread out in this sort of sneaking round the X. Then as you can see, there's sort of correlation. As this value is higher than zero, this becomes higher than zero, and slowly it dies out, but then as this is negative, the next one is negative, so there's a positive correlation between this, this distance and this distance is positive. So there's some sort of correlation between two points. That, however, causes our betas to be inefficient again. Their variance will be wider, higher again. Beta variance will be higher if this is something else. What we wanted is this, remember? The in an ideal case. So, if this is the case, don't run OLS to estimate the coefficient estimate. Yeah? Don't run OLS. Why not? You can, you can find better estimators. Maybe non-linear, maybe generalized method of moments estimate. However, however, like in the late, in the later on in the, uh, in the subject, the scientists come up with remedies to, uh, to the, uh, to the OLS, uh, sorry, uh, autocorrelation. They, they said we should include the lagged values of X's. This is time, time series, we're jumping further ahead. But that's a good question, why not run OLS? This is because your beta here, Beta 1 will be uh, something different than what it should be if you have autocorrelation in the residuals. So this will be inefficiently calculated value. In other words, uh, it will not have the same value as the true value. And also, it will not have the smallest standard deviation. You can run some other estimator. Now, what we wanted, if you remember, was a situation where errors do not have any sort of pattern. Yeah? Along this curve, we have data points. You see, there are two different things, yeah? If your data is scattered around this line, then there's a linear relationship between your X and Y. Yeah, that's why you should usually do a scatter plot to see if there's any linear relationship between the two. But here it looks like a linear relationship, but there is also systematic correlation between the other values, x and y. Yeah, this sort of between the x's, I should say, not the between the x's. Yeah. So here we have to consider maybe we should use some other maybe we should use some other estimator, not OLS. But then these days we have some remedies for OLS. So let's go on. Um, when the assumption said the values of the disturbance term have independent distributions. Yeah, that means basically they are not correlated with each other. In other words, when one this one point, the the errors, the errors are not correlated between each other. You see, um, what we did earlier. I'm gonna draw it now again because I closed this file. So errors. Let's say there's an error bar here. Yeah. I'm going to take time for this one. 
So the first observation, second, third, fourth, goes, goes on, yeah? Now you calculated the errors. This is basically your y minus y hat, yeah? And values are 0, 0.5, 1, 2, 3, then it goes on 3.5. Now this is systematically correlated. In other words, as, as we go along the observation, this is growing, yeah? This means there is a positive correlation between the values. Now, I will now create another set of similar series. And we, we want that or we don't want we that? We don't want this. Okay. This is the correlation. This is serial correlation. Autocorrelation as well. Um, I'm going to tell you something for real. So this is autocorrelation. Now next this. Look at this. 1, 2, 3, 4, n. In here we have 0 0.5 minus 0 0.8, 1, minus 0 0.3, 2, sorry, minus 0, let's see, minus 0 0.8, 1, and so on. You see, this is random. The sequence is random here. Can you see the point? While the sequence here is not, this is growing over time. The errors are growing over time, means they actually correlate with each other. As one goes up, the next one will go up, and so on and so forth. Well, here, the second uh, sequence is unpredictable. In one observation, we have a value of positive error. In the second observation, the error is negative, positive, negative, negative, positive. So this is hard to predict. It's hard to, I mean, it's hard to see any systematic pattern. So this error is most likely is coming from this regression, while this error is most likely coming this error regression, yeah? For some reasons, uh, for some regions of this regression, for example, errors are positive because all the dots are above in this region, all the dots are below the line in this region, all the dots are above the line. So you see this pattern, above, below, above, below, creates this correlation within the error itself. This is called serial correlation. In other words, if you cut the data into half, if, they, if you cut, yeah. Um, how do I increase my cursor because I keep for, uh, losing this side of it. If I let's say cut, if I cut this data into half, take this one top part as x star and take the remaining part as y star, let's say, and I can correlate them. And if the correlation is positive, that's a serial correlation. But here, I can cut the data, create two sets of vari uh, variables from this a two set of uh, a set of two variables let's say x star and y star and if i correlate them they don't correlate because here there's there's randomness all this is random as in here and this is not random you see in some cases in some observations we have positive errors in some negative and this within this region everything is negative within this region everything is positive so you should have some variation negative and positive yeah? if this is clear we need to move on Lastly, central limit theorem. The errors here, guys, if I go back, uh, I jump too fast. Something's happening with my. Yeah. Residuals are normally distributed. This is a big assumption, usually very strong assumption, and we do not expect them to happen in the real world. And in many cases, we actually violate this assumption, and you will actually talk about this in, a, in your assignment as well. You do a battery of tests to, to see if, if you are uh, satisfying these assumptions. First thing is, you will talk about whether the parameters are linear in your model, that's going to be your assignment thing. Whether there is some sort of variation. Um, it's stuck. Okay. And whether this is zero by looking at the minimum value and maximum value. And whether this is satisfied as well, whether there is a constant variation. And whether there is a serial correlation or not, most likely you will not have it because it's a cross-section. The data you will be collecting is but coming to this one, you will get stuck because you will not have normal distribution. 
in many cases because of the large variation and outliers existence in 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 the in the actual uh, in the actual data set so something that i just drawn here is ideal ideal <coughs> if you draw the histogram for these errors what you will see is i'm going to scroll down now so i need to get okay here so in an ideal case these are your uh, frequency these are your errors histogram will look like this in an ideal case so you can put a nice density curve which is normal curve yeah errors are centered around what zero mean remember the expected value of errors was equal to zero yeah mu is this is what we expect this this assumption is very strong this is what the assumption tells us the errors are normally distributed with zero mean here even if they don't have a zero mean they are still normally distributed that's a very strong assumption and if this is not normal obviously you're violating this second assumption of this OLS yeah this has to be zero yeah we expect it to be zero and now we tested it uh, with an example as well really. but in reality in the data you will have some countries this is about 30 country data that you're going to collect and hopefully it will be it will be live soon uh, i'm just waiting for the guy to uh, approve it what's his name george zeros or Z what is his name he, he needs to approve it he's the internal moderator for me uh, for the assignment and tests and it will go out to the external but i think the assignment ne doesn't need to be going to the external moderator because it's 25 percent of the waiting room of the total mark anything above 50 will usually go out to that uh, another university to get a, to get that approval um so in reality this sort of thing is rare the values uh, of uh, data across uh, along the line will not be close to it or will not be this perfect instead we have some guy here some guy sitting here some guy sitting here some guy sitting there some a bunch of countries here you see this is a sort of thing and when you when you draw the errors density you might end up having this as the x's increase y's grow so the zero assumption or normality assumption is basically may not hold in in real world that's that's the point here i'm trying to tell you with the a6 assumption six um, in such cases we shouldn't run ols as it is in such cases what's the remedy here simple remedy you can think of it by looking at this graph center it around the peak just take this data in this range ignore the outliers yeah yeah ignore them because what they are doing is they are confusing OLS this line basically is good for representing something within short distance yeah but, but not these point this is actually far off the mean value yeah for that one you may need another line this is probably the better fit yeah then in that case this beta is completely different than this beta here. Wouldn't you want to absorb some of the error in beta? In beta one. Yeah, but this is yeah. Beta. This becomes too big. It's usually OLS doesn't tolerate outliers. The beta zero becomes too large or biased itself as well biased. So outliers should really be cut off. That's why what you usually do is. You rank, uh, rank your data from the minimum to the maximum, cut the top 10%, bottom 10%. Because the, at the top, you may have these outlier guys, you know, rich countries. At the bottom, you may have very poor countries. In between lies similar countries in terms of wealth. And you can run the OLS. Then that gives us this sort of nice... Where is my cursor again? It's very small. Can you see it, guys? Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, it's right. Yeah, it's now I see <laughs> Sorry, I cannot see it. Um, so yeah, we want to have some sort of uh, constant variation, not large variation. Now you see these outliers, what this causes. You may have noticed this, that because of this non-normality, one other assumption is violated. 
Homo- heteroskeda, yes. There is anas homoskedastic because yes, homoskedastic means errors have a constant value. Heteroskedastic means errors have non-constant because in here in this region you can see this in this region errors are homoskedastic, not many outliers, but in this region these guys are pulling the errors away from the mean. So there is no constancy here. So two assumptions just violated with no normality. And what you see is this. So, by the way, final thing. Because, this is the idea, this, this is something I forgot. Because the normality of variables, uh, sorry, normality of distribution of these errors is true, we would expect, we would expect, we would expect the betas also to have a normal distribution. So if this is the beta distribution, this is our beta distribution, yeah? Then the true value of betas will be population value here. Mu beta. Yeah? Because, because the errors are normal, errors have a normal distribution, coefficient estimates are also normally distributed. That's according to the central limit theorem. I'm going to go back, switch back, and tell, read, I'll let you read this. This is what exactly the graph that I draw. This whole expression here, whole statement here, means what I just drawn. Yeah? Remember, beta is a random variable. We are trying to estimate it. Because the errors are Normal betas are also normal. That's what CTL central limit estimates are normally distributed. Which is beta zero or beta both. both betas usually, because both of them are function of x and y, and y is a function of u, u being normal means y is normal, y normal means x normal, x normal means beta is normal. So that's composite structure here. Now, however, in reality there exists so many different way, uh, estimators. So many different estimators. Now, we should make a brief conclusion here. If all these assumptions are true and hold in our data, OLS is blue. It's blue? Yes. <laughs> it's blue, I put it in red. It's the best linear unbiased estimator. This is just an acronym for best linear unbiased estimator. So if all assumptions are true? Yeah, well, if all six assumptions are true, Usually it's at least the one to five, the first five, has to be true. But central limit theorem in its most strict form tells us that all assumptions have to be true for the OLS to be blue. In other words, it has to be best, which is efficient. It has the smallest variation. It's linear. We just looked at it, yeah? It's a line. OLS is imposed a line. Unbiased means in repeated samples, we are very close to the actual beta. An estimator is just an estimator. Estimate is a formula. Now, this is a difficult one. A lot of students, especially at Queen Mary, apart from the top 10%, will not get it, what blue means and what estimate is. We are in a small group. I expect all of you to understand it, and I'm spending an hour just on these few slides. For the reason, this will be in the test as the first oh. question. Blueness of it, yeah? There are four questions within the first question. It starts with the graphs that I've just drawn. Obviously, there's not much to do here. You don't have to explain the page or thing. Few comments on each part of the thing. And now, 
What does blue mean? Blue means basically OLS is the is this one, is the one that's peaking. If you if you if in a world of estimators you put probability density function of all the estimators, the OLS is the one with the least distance between them, so the least variation. That's called best. Yeah, it's the efficient one. So the E stands for what? Estimator. Oh, unbiased estimator. Yes. OLS is all ordinary least squares is an estimator that's blue. So uh, there's a lot of things behind this thing, uh, behind this thing, in terms of uh, conceptual and theoretical aspect. But as we practice, it comes, you know, I will now do, in the next few slides, I will show you how to create this. Notice this, this is the true distribution of betas. Beta 2 means, obviously, the, uh, in this case, is, is the slope coefficient. We usually have beta 0 and beta 1, but this textbook has beta 1 and beta 2. Yeah, this is the slope coefficient. So both distributions, as you can see, uh, is centered around the true mean. So these are beta hats. If you calculate beta hats and create their density curve, OLS has the best distribution. In other words, most narrow distribution. So this means in real life, OLS is almost never the best estimator. Yeah, in real life, almost none of the estimators because of the data. In real life, usually you don't get this, but we assume that's the case. In real life, you have you see some outliers create betas that lie here. Some create betas like here, so the tails become fatter. And maybe this one is better than this estimate is better, the, the fat estimate with the fat tail. So this is an other unbiased estimator. You see, both of them are unbiased. It's just one has longer, uh, sorry, wider variation. OLS has a shorter one, it's more efficient. The second one is not efficient, but it's unbiased. Unbiased means the value that you calculate from the next sample will be very close to this original value, yeah? That's unbiasedness. Efficiency means narrow. It's, it's not wide. Let's test this now, in a minute. Um, this, the central limit theorem says, basically, as the n, size of the n, I should say gauss marker, the size of the n, the, the sample size, increases over time, the distributing gets narrower and narrower. More efficient. More efficient, yeah. That's why you should have a large sample in your analysis. So it tends closer towards the normal distribution. It, yes. Uh, well, it's, it's normal, but it becomes less widespread. You see, you can have a normal distribution which is very... Yeah, yeah, yeah of course, but yeah. it tends more and more towards... But it becomes distribution. a normal yeah. distribution, yes. That's one, one aspect of it. But you will see in a minute that with 10, with 10 samples, we can get a normal distribution, but it's wide. Mm -hmm. um, as we estimate, uh, as we increase the sample, the, the variation in the betas becomes smaller and smaller, so it becomes even narrower than that. It, in the end, the limiting distribution is basically one point, it's just one single sort of and the density curve. So you have a better confidence in terms Yeah, that's another point, yeah. So the betas are yeah. uh, the dependent, or no, the independent variables. In this case, betas are our unknown parameters. You know the y equal to beta 1, x, so x is the known one, we know the data, but beta is something that we're calculating, let's go. Uh, what's your take on like, what sample size would you consider large? Oh, there's no limit to it. How large is large is very questionable thing. I mean, we, we, the question that everyone asks, the largest sample is the population itself. Mm -hmm. We usually sample from population, yeah? So, whatever the population is, we just go ahead with it. If there are only four people in the population, or four observations, that's the largest we can get, so we just take it as the large, largest one, yeah? Mm -hmm. But you can sample two of the observations and run it, yeah? The largest, I mean, largeness is, I mean, size is basically, uh, uh, no one knows. But larger the better, that's but what we know. If you're taking the whole population, so it's not a sample. It's very hard to get the whole population of students in the world, for example. Yeah, 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 no, yeah. yeah so but larger the better. Large is the but you, you don't have estimate points. values anymore, you have like then the you proper have values. actual population values. And then the only thing in a correlation that is the, the only thing that changes it from the from a real life situation is the 
unestimated error, you put the unexplained error. Yes, unobservable, yes. That's, that's usually unexplained, yeah. Yes, go. So the estimation becomes more efficient? Estimator. Estimator. In other words, as you... <laughs> understand this. Okay, let me draw it. Actually, good point. I, I wouldn't think of it if without your question. You see, every time you ask questions, something is flashing my mind. Okay, let's let's do this. <laughs> Pen. Okay, assume this is my normally distributed beta hats, beta one hats. So it could be beta two if it's a, if it's this book. Yeah. Assume this is normal distribution. This is if you split the if you fold it right in the middle with the actual beta one, this is the population, I don't put the hat, this is my mu beta one. Now, this is my whole sample, oh, population, say this is my population. I sample and estimate beta one hat. And from this sample, this beta one, some hat lies somewhere here. Say this is beta one hat one or prime. I take another sample. This is two. This one goes here. Somewhere there. Next sample. It gives me another one. You see, I'm calculating the betas, taking samples from population. And the betas change from sample to sample. This is called sampling variation of estimators. Each time my estimator spits out a beta which is an estimate. And this time maybe I am closer now to the true population. It's this one here. Yeah? Now take another one. Four. Maybe this time this guy here is right here. Yeah? Next sample may give me something else. You see what I'm trying to do? I'm creating a random sample of betas. As a result, because of this variation, betas are random variables themselves. And this time, maybe I am very much spot on and it just falls this beta just what I wanted, the true population of it. And so on and so forth. So they make up all these things. But the point here is this. Because this estimator, OLS, Uh, let's put covariance here, x and y. Is the blue one. I won't get a beta which is coming from uh, from another estimate or another distribution. I won't get a beta that's coming from another distribution which is which is lying somewhere here, far from here. It's very few values lie here <coughs> on the tails. Very few values lie here. Very few values lie here. Yeah? Blue means basically my betas are closer to the mean. Yeah, this is the closest we can get. This is OLS. Now, because they are close to the mean, they are unbiased as well. The bias is small. It necessarily, it is not necessarily in practice 100% unbiased, but they are to an extent unbiased compared to, for example, this estimator. So, for example, if I have another estimator, ah, this, I wanted the peak right here, basically. The peak should really have been here. Okay. This is another estimator here. So, both of them, notice this, both of them, so this is OLS, this is some other, so let's say this is GMM, Generalized Method of Moments Estimator. Both of them have exactly the same, they calculate exactly the same beta for me. They have the same population beta, if I calculate them. But this is, and this one here is the efficient one. This one here is not the efficient because many of the betas fall on the tails, the high prob with a high probability. While OLS ones high lie mostly or spread around the close to the mean. Now, does that does that answer your question? 
what needs to be efficient. It's the estimator needs to be efficient for the betas to be close to the to the mean. Yeah? But it's because the betas are close to the mean that it is efficient, right? It is efficient, because also unbiased. Yeah. yeah. Efficient you see how do you measure the efficiency guys? Yeah but how the spread is out, yeah? How spread yeah, out the beta but, is, yeah? Um, so the sample size increases the mm -hmm. efficiency of the estimate. As we sam increase the sample, yes, it becomes more efficient as well and also more unbiased, I would say. Mm -hmm. With a size, a high sample, we benefit from efficiency, not necessarily unbiasedness, but we benefit from more efficiency. The, the estimator becomes more efficient. In other words, we gain, with the sample size, we gain more information, right? we make better decisions. So the same with the OLS. Yes. Higher samples create blue estimators. But efficiency stands out here because the distribution narrows down. Yeah? Clear? Sorry? Yes. Yeah. Okay, fine. You're just looking and no change in the facial, facial expression, so I thought maybe <laughs> you have a question. <laughs> now, how do we test how efficient or how blue our estimator is. It looks like we're running out of time. We have a very long list of things here to do. Okay. <laughs> so a lot of reading for you guys then. Um, I can skip this simulation. Here I wanted to demonstrate how estimator means. Okay, I'm gonna skip the steps because I here have, what I have is the steps on how to do simulation analysis. Wait, what is a Monte Carlo? Do we need to know this? For the, no, for intuition, yes. Not for exam. Intuition, yes. For in the exam, you just draw two graphs and show that one density, as I just said, is more efficient than the other one, which is widespread, yeah? So, but I want to show it right here with the central limit theorem and gauss markle theorem. So this is our estimated, yeah? So we're gonna do this now. Uh, this is a whole bunch of slides that takes ages. I'm gonna run R. I'm gonna run R here. For the sake of brevity, we're gonna skip all this. Um, at, however, at Queen Mary, I would have done a very fraction of what I'm doing now. we we'll be just focus on, I will show this distribution and tell the student to read what it means. Here I explain you <laughs> step by step. You see how... But how many lectures do you have a week? Then? The same, one, one, oh, one lecture, one hour. Imagine this. And they're expected to do four hours of extra reading after leaving the lecture room, mm -hmm. before the problem set uh, is more. done in the seminar. Hmm? The the seminar is basically one hour again. So it's a very hard to study there. But those I see students actually in the library until 12 o'clock and beyond, because I sometimes do my own work and then go past by the... Uh, you know, uh, so PM? yeah, and AM, not <laughs> PM. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exam time. The library is 20, 24 hour open, so yeah, students yeah. sleep there. So, really? They have they have a room for prayer. Uh, people who to pray, Jewish and Muslim room. They actually go in there and sleep and come out. <laughs> and like that. Some libraries, yes. If you have a campus library, I think LSE is open 24 hours. Yeah, there's a but I don't know if there's a sleeping. Area. The medical one. In in Bond Street, it's also has 30. Yes, must be. Yeah. Anyway. Um, okay, let's see this this thing. Believe me, this is... People do like all night or 24 hours. But that way you don't have to go for much more. Does it still have <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> you do it? I do it? Uh, no, I like breaks. Like shower? <laughs> no, you can sleep there. <laughs> but there's where you can stay 24 hours and not sleep, so people just get a sofa, get a pillow, and like, sleep. <laughs> I want to try it. I'd like to try it. I even had a student in the class uh, who brought a pillow with him. <laughs> yeah, he had a pillow. Third he was class. sleeping on the on the table. I didn't realize it until somebody pointed at it. <laughs> so I I woke him up and told him to leave because it will affect people standing behind him, and they will probably feel sleepy as well if he if they see him sleeping. Or he could do anything in his sleep, so you'll never know. 
So I would rather leave. <laughs> so if you had a that nightmare. Was, that was in the library? Or? No, it was in the lecture because he brought it. Apparently he didn't sleep during the previous night. <laughs> Why would you go to the lecture? <laughs> this Chinese, Chinese guy. Uh, maybe in China they are low pillows, but not in China. Maybe in China you're not supposed to skip classes. Normally here you just skip the class. Very hard there, yes, I know, this is a long hour. Anyway, communism is a different story here. Okay, let's practice and see what happens to the estimator, distribution of the estimator, beta one, as we raise this, as increase the size of the sample. So I'm gonna uh, clear the workspace, which is already clean anyway. So this, one question, is this then what we also have to show in the exam or no? No, you just have to draw graph with two distributions, one wider, one narrow, to show that it's OLS is efficient and it's, it's blue. Okay. Other estimate it can be. But here I'm gonna show you with a, with a practical example. So let's assume that the true population beta zero, which is our intercept is one, beta one is our slope coefficient two, and we will now create a, a, a line here. This is from the web uh, Moodle, I've downloaded it. I will upload it earlier last week. So this is, you will have this as well. You can practice at home with comments. Now notice this n size means the size of the sample is increasing Initial first of my first of my uh, first sample I I took is five observation sample. Next one is ten observation. Next one is fifty. Goes on and goes on. So I am creating this uh, set of uh, five samples increasing. Remember, as the sample size increases, OS well, gets efficient. That's what I said. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we're gonna test now if it does actually. And what we do is we run the simulation one thousand times. We'll run it 1,000 times and create the distribution density for each sample size. So, 1,000 for each sample size. Yes, what happens is that, yes, um, in the first instance, the OLS calculates betas with a size of, sample size of 5 1,000 times. So 1,000 beta 1s with sample size of 5. But then it's repeating the sample. Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. This, it's, it varies. I'll show you now in a minute how it's done. We're drawing from What's samples the, from a population of normally distributed observations. Okay. Let me show you in a graph. What's the total population? Five. Right. No, 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 no. Sample no, is five no, out no, of a population of. No, no. There's so no limit. Five, there. time, five, two times, five, three this is my population, yeah? Is the population infinite? Yeah. We assume that it's infinite. We just draw size of five here in yeah. equal five and calculate beta one. Draw exactly the same thing, n5, calculate beta 1, hat, hat, this is 1, this is 2, pick up another one, and then, just an average. And then it's an average. And then you have thousands of these, and if you create a density for them, this is what you're going to get. Next exercise, it's exactly the same for population. I'm going to take larger sample now, n equals 10. Calculate betas. Now, if I draw this pop, it will be higher, but yes, it, it will be something like this. Okay. Yeah, this distance is narrowing now. Yeah. That's the exercise. Just to show you that as the sample size grows, estimator becomes efficient. So M. Now, my beta one hat is based is going to it's a matrix that is going to store all the thousand betas all the thousand betas in each case beta one hats gonna store wait a sec beta one hat why did i create this uh where do one I? Hat and the hats? ah this one is for each sample this one is for each separate sample and this one is for just storing temporarily. Okay. Yeah, and then we just store all five into one matrix afterwards for drawing purposes. Then I run a loop, for loop, which goes on a thousand times each time. Yeah, it, it goes on a thousand times. This is, remember this, this is beta zero plus beta one times x plus error. And I assume errors are normally distributed. Yeah, this is the assumption of OLS. And our axis, 
the x comes from a normal distribution 2 with a mean 0 and standard deviation 2. I'll show you something in a minute once it's done. Standard deviation 2? Yeah. You see, I'm multiplying the normally distributed okay, okay, distribution okay. by 2 means yeah, actually okay. mean is 0 already, it's just the standard deviation becomes 2. And I'll increase it to 10 to, so, to show you how variation affects the beta's calculation in a minute. And then I run, so this is just the data frame now. I combine y and x, just like we did with uh, math scores and reading scores this morning. I combine y and x and estimate using this data zero and extract the betas using the coefficient function. This just extracts coefficient estimates, beta zero and beta one. But in this case, I am only interested in beta 1, so that's 2 here, second in the list. And I store them, I store them again, and here, I'm just plotting them, I should say. This is a plot. It creates the plot of all the density curves that's calculated. So we should get five different density curves. So let's run it. I'm going to run whole thing. I hope it won't embarrass me with errors. <laughs> let's go. Oh, it's going. You see this red button? It's going. No error. No error. That's good. Done. Okay, okay I don't have enough space here, so I'm going to uh, raise this. And do everything again. Because it's not actually showing all the... Run it again. You see how quick the computer is. It runs 1,000 times each time. So I have five, so it's what, 50, uh, 5,000 runs. Notice this, this black one here doesn't have the legend, but this black distribution, the distribution of betas using black one, uh, using five samples. So the, the variation is wide here. As I increase the sample size, the red one is 10, size of sen sample size of 10. The green one is the size sample size of next one is, I think, 100. And, and then this is 500. You see how narrow the distribution has become. But notice what happened in, in, in most important one is, this is unbiased because all this distribution has a mean value of two. You see the right middle here. The, apart from the black one. Black one looks like it's a bit deviating here. The peak is different. And I can see here is as well. The mean of the first sample is 199. Second sample is exactly two. As I increase the sample, notice this. My mean, <coughs> population mean, is actually, I mean, uh, estimate is very close to two. Remember I said I, I deliberately fixed the beta at two. And if I increase the sample size, my estimates are very close to beta. So that this is the beta value two populate close to population but my estimate is slightly off the off the mark here yeah makes sense guys yeah and notice this the maximum minimum value is close to zero here just just less than one and the maximum beta is four and you see the uncertainty here the variation in this is all black distribution here density curve and that's when you use only five observations now we're going back to this assumption now very quickly. There's a bunch of slides here that's manually I describe it here. You can also check that. Going back, back here. Uh, where is it? This one. To estimate meaningful betas, we should have some variation, right? In x's. So I'm going to increase the variance of x. I'm going to increase the variance of x. It creates uncertainty, obviously. So let's say I multiply the variance by by eight. It's going to be the, the x will have a wide variation. And what happens? Oh. Close attention to this as well. Okay, let's run this again. So it's going to run and run and run. hopefully it gives us the. What did I increase? The variation actually declined. That's mm. interesting. It's narrower. Yes, it's actually narrower. I expect it to be wider, but <laughs> it become even more efficient. <laughs> ah, 
let me do this. It's in the errors. I'm sorry. It's in the errors that we get the thing. It's this one here. Apologies. So let's run this one. This one should give it to you. It's however narrow. Surprisingly, my minimum is not even uh, close to below one. It's actually much above. It's basically the, the distribution got got narrower. Um, that's something I didn't test myself. So let's let's check this now. This should create this uncertainty. Yeah, this is wider. You see now we went into even minus 20s and plus 40s. So the errors when they scattered around, this is what I was wanted to probably describe and then I mistakenly told you something else. You see this, what we did is, first one, first case, so errors became kind of widespread. So you can have all possible results because of this. So distance here is basically uh, quite wider as as the spread increases. So the possibility of getting any beta, so you can even hit, uh, put, uh, where is the thing? Ah, here. Having this curve is possible as well, as a result, yeah, this beta. So the possibility, a lot of vari variation in beta, so that affects whole distribution. So betas do not have a limit, basically, as a result. Anyway, is this clear to you guys? Yeah. That as the sample size grows, we have an efficient estimator. And OLS is the best linear unbiased estimator. Now, with this simulation, I'm going to skip a lot of slides because there is this. Uh, there is this uh, manual one as well. So step by step explanation of how we calculate the errors here how we assign values and how we calibrate the simulation. So this is my first sample. You see this beta is 0 0.5154. So I'm going to move. But my true value is actually 0 0.5. If I go to the next sample, now I get 0 0.48. Yeah. So with this thousand simulations, I have thousands of this. Um, so we construct this. And the next sample gives us 0 0.45. And if we keep going, you see, from sample to sample of the same size, I get so many different betas. And if you get the average of it, we expect this average to be close to 0 0.5. But then that's not enough. You see this, uh, with the small sample size, the construction, when you construct the density curve using a histogram, notice what happens, it's quite wide. Yeah, it's quite wide, possibilities are wide. But if you keep increasing, the thing becomes more normal, the density becomes more normal, yeah, although some of these are peaky, but the average is centered around 0 0.5 here. And it's more efficient and unbiased as the sample size increases. Or as you create more samples within uh, within the, uh, what do you call this, uh, with the same size of the sample. Now going further. Now, the beta 2 essentially becomes the, uh, as the, as the sample size increases, UI becomes zero. If you take the expectations operator on both sides, beta 2's expectation is basically beta 2, plus the expectation of UI is zero, so UI is zero, so zero times A becomes zero. So this whole thing becomes completely zero. So with the sample size or repeated samples, the the blue assumption holds. It's the best, efficient, in other words, best means efficient, linear, fine, unbiasedness here. So in this exercise, the unbiasedness holds because we, as we increase the sample size, our use tend to zero. The average of the use tend to zero. Yeah, that's the idea here. Now, you will not be discussing this sort of uh, formula in the uh, what you call this assignment. But at least what I draw, what I've driven, I should say, on the drone in the in these videos, is useful for the for the good answer. So I'm not expecting you to 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 write whole expression. At least, if you could state the beta to as the estimator with using this formula, and then show me these two density curves with the wider, wider variation and the narrow one, and tell which one is more efficient, which one is more unbiased. In fact, both of them should be unbiased, but one is efficient than the other one, which is OLS efficient. Yeah. So that that's enough. Yeah. So the slides contain a little bit more, obviously. 
So that's the standard deviation we talked about earlier, the variation. Square root of variation is usually standard deviation. So I'm going to skip that. And some of the writing here. And now we will come to the point where we will be doing hypothesis testing. And hypothesis testing is based on the variation of this estimator. Smaller the variation, the better it is. So let's go down here. Let me tell you what these slides are actually showing us. This is our population. density curve. Now, the, how do we know how reliable our estimate is? Let's say we calculated that some beta one had. How do we know this is reliable? One way to look at it is test the significance of the coefficient estimate. In other words, significance implies how close or far the beta one is from away from from its true value. In other words, if it's here, if it's this point here, we want to know how close this is to this true value. And that instance, in this, in this, in this, in this case, I should say, we should uh, calculate the standard deviation of this distribution. So we are interested in the standard deviation of the distribution. So we need to, <coughs> to work out how significant the beta one is. We need to work out how far this lies away from the actual beta, so you need to calculate, uh, work out what this standard deviation of. This is then hypothesis testing. Now we we building the fundament uh, fundamental concepts for hypothesis testing now. So the reliable beta one is when. Uh, oh no, I haven't actually told you what is reliable, but we need to test for reliability, or can we base our uh, inference? Or the uh, can we base our assumptions or what do you call this? Did that inference on these results? Can we do this? Are these beta reliable? To answer this question, we now need to work out the variation in betas, and we need a formula for this. So we need to work out what the standard deviation of the uh, the estimator is. And then the next step is the st uh, uh, significance testing, hypothesis testing. So we are at the moment figuring out how to test the so when, how to estimate the variation of the betas. Yes, go on. Wait, 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 uh, when you say um, the variation of betas, is that beta hat or just the actual beta? Usually it's the actual ones, but because we don't observe the actual ones, yeah. we assume the beta hats have variation. Okay, so we use the. We yeah. want to estimate the variation of the beta hat. No, we want to estimate the variation of the true beta using the beta hat. Yeah, and the same as not this guys, we are estimating the true beta one using beta hat one. Yeah, yeah. we are estimating it. Yeah. Don't forget this. Yeah, so it's the same variation of. Um, oh, this should be this. So this is the true beta. This is the estimator. So we are estimating the average of the beta one hats so that they are equal to, you know, to see if they are equal to true beta. Yeah, the same with the variation as well. In other words, when I say variation, I'm referring to standard deviation here or variance, which is the square of standard deviation. If everyone is okay with that, here is the formula. This has a very long list of derivation steps, but you are not required to memorize it or do anything with it in the test. As long as you know conceptually what it is and when we use it. Because in the ex exam, I will give you the estimated standard errors, which are actually standard deviation of that distribution, the distribution of betas.
Ah, this is the point where I made this uh, mistake earlier. So I picked up the wrong, uh, wrong simulation. There are two files, simulation files. But it, at least it it was useful for <laughs> for our purpose of sampling variation earlier. Now let me. This is this is interesting here. Um, just take a minute here and look at what it depends on. What it uh, what the uh, variation depends on here. Our our focus should really be on beta two. Beta two is the slope. Beta one here is the uh, intercept. Usually we do not calculate the intercept standard deviations, and we are not interested in. Now, in any case, look at this. What happens is that the variation is larger if the variation of u gets larger. So variation or variance of beta one is proportional to the variance of u's. And maybe that's why if you go back to this, if I go back to my uh, R, are you guys copying? And also, size is inversely proportional to the, or the, uh, the, the variance of betas is inversely proportional to the, uh, to the size of the sample. So as the size of the sample increases, the distance between the mean and the beta decreases. That's why we have the efficiency as the, as the thing grows, yeah? And at the same time, another important point is that variation in x's, this is, remember this is the va uh, variance of x, xi minus x bar. <coughs> as the variation is, of x goes up, the variation or variance of beta goes down. So that's why we got that funny situation where I thought I multiplied the variance of x by 8 and ended up having a very narrow distribution. This is because of this relationship, which I ignored in my, uh, essentially, in my other, uh, <laughs> essentially, I mean, in my other dis demonstration. Now, it's the same here. The slope coefficient is directly proportional to the variance of u. So we would like to have smaller variance in use, in other words, homoscedastic, but small, not hetero, because hetero means actually it gets wider over time, yeah? So that means that our sigma ui squared will be higher. So sigma ui, uh, sorry, sigma u squared is basically the variance of the error term. As this goes up, naturally this goes up because it's in the numerator. Now, however, if the variance in x's goes up, variance of beta goes down, it is it's causing the density curve to be narrow. So we would like to have as much variation in x that could explain why for this to be more efficient, for the estimator to be more efficient. Make sense to you guys? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. I'm going to skip a bunch of stuff because this is demonstration of what I've just said here. For example, this one here, this one, you see that variation in x is small, but variation in y here is bigger. And what does he want to do here? Let me read it, because I created this, but I don't remember now from last week. slightly different for some reason they wanted to show you this is from the book you put them together so that they, they are more meaningful but I think you see this point here the dotted points dotted points are the non-stochastic part this is like a line straight line we add the u to make it stochastic so dotted points just the linear part then we have the actual dots now, this solid line is the regression line. Now, actual dots now here are with smaller variation in use. That's good, right? Yeah. And here, the variation is very wide. As a result, the, the line here is just poorly approximated. 
we want to have as close as possible to the dotted line because dotted line is, is a true line. Okay. Yeah. So small With the line. outliers, the U's are wider. You see the U's are wider here. So the, the OLS is tries to attach this, or how do you call this? Move itself towards this line. At the same time, it wants to move towards this line as well. As a result, it it's no it's not actually approximating the true line, true dotted line. The dotted line is a true line, but with the errors, it's moving upwards. As a result, it's a bad approximation of the. So we don't get 0 0.5. We may get 0 0.6. Here we get uh, something close to 0 0.5. Make sense to you guys? What does that mean? <coughs> Non stochastic means it's the dotted part, the true true line. It's this part. Okay. Yeah. Then we add the U's. That creates this actual dots. Mm -hmm. With the dots, yeah. With the U's, I should say. So with the large error variation, our estimator will be inefficient. Oh well, it's not precise in other words, when it becomes inefficient, it's, it's not precise. Clear guys? Yeah. The assumptions are a little tedious to, look, to go through. I'm gonna, s uh, this is just the same thing as we discussed earlier, that the beta's uh, variation variance depends on n and this and this, so it's just uh, in the text form. Yeah, it's inversely related, for example, to n. So I'm gonna skip this. I've already talked about that. And here is about the axis. Again, we want to have a variation in axis. If there's a wider variation, the distribution becomes narrow, which I've described it already in the simulation. Remember the simulation uh, study that we did a little earlier? I multiplied the axis by a factor of eight, and we had even narrower density curve. While the, uh, this is a simple one here, uh, very quickly. You see the axis, the first x is 9.1, second one is 9.2. So there is very little variation between the two. But here, variation is high, it is between 1 and 2, there is a, a bunch of numbers of difference 1, yeah? So if the axes are very much bunched up together, what do you call this, bundled up together, very close to each other, we turn, tend to have very wide distribution, just like the exercise. But if the variation in x is you know, wider and is, is taking account of or takes into account all the variation in y, obviously the estimator becomes narrower, the density becomes narrower. That's the, the uh, sort of the graphical distribution or demonstration of what we just did in <coughs> simulation. Can you say that again? If the, the, if the x, x varies. Close together, then? Ah, if the x's are close together, the, uh, the efficiency is. is lower or what we call this it's imprecise estimators are imprecise less efficient. yeah you can say less efficient if you want yeah but with this one with a wider variation in the axis we have more precise betas or efficient betas yeah they're all unbiased most of them are unbiased they, they hit the target the mean of them is 0 0.5, it's just one is wider, one is uncertain. If you use this sample and pick up another sample from this population and calculate the beta, it could be far here, far right here. So distance is wider, yeah? But with this density, in other words, with the x's that, that have variation, great variation among themselves, then next sample might get a beta which is very close to my population, yeah? The probability of falling far away from the actual beta is lower with the axis that has... But isn't it if the axes are closer together then you have more like, precise... <coughs> okay, there's this, this thing. Okay, that's a good point here. Yeah? Uh, let me draw, draw this again. <coughs> there are two options. Good question. You see, you should question everything. And otherwise, ideas will, will not come to me. <laughs> I, I simply go on with what I can remember. You know, there's a lot of information that I need to be, uh, you know, need to keep in mind, but I won't usually. With, if you ask, then I can remember. <laughs> so, this is the case I think you are referring to, right? 
when the x's are close to the line yeah then it's more precise perfect yes this is fine the beta will be nice here but yeah you said the, the, the it's efficient no 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 listen this is x bar mm -hmm. and this x here is far from this one right yeah and this x is even further so this is the variation sigma of x there now in this situation <coughs> this is what we're looking at this point and this point is very close little variation little variation yeah can you see the difference here being closer doesn't necessarily mean what you call this precision being closer to the mean it's in this case you are being closer to the line but in this case you are being close to the mean here the variance of this is is greater than the variance of this because dots are very close to x bar average so i can put a beta sorry y hat here this is one i can put this I can even put this and all of them look proper to me I mean look valid to me because there's no correlation between them X is close to its mean at it at every point while here it's not there is some variation in the second one there's a good question that you asked again but I, I actually I, sh I showed this one a little early right in the yeah. assumption number two or three yeah but that's oh, that's the same thing here as well so this slide is basically demonstrating the same thing. Now, so this highlighted, yellow highlighted part are the ones that we are focusing because this is for intercept. This is for beta one hat. We want beta two hat in our estimates. Now it looks like we're gonna continue interpreting this and and talking about intercepts next week. But next week I think Mariana will be sitting somewhere here observing us. So please don't use mobile phones. I usually let you take a look at it and do these things, but with her, it's a slightly different case. You know? So it, it's, I, I should really tell you to stop using it, but then some of us need a bit of distraction before we get gain that tension, uh, focus. So I usually understand, I, I usually let the students do it, but if it goes on for a long time, I'll use I'm just using the college Wi Fi to download the thing. I'm not using it. Yeah, fine. No, no, I, do, I realize some of you, especially you, use a lot of mobile phones. Uh, a lot of times in, you get distracted very quickly but you should ask me a question if, if, if it's too difficult does it make I mean what make, uh, drives you what you call this uh, this behavior what, why do you use a lot uh, more of this mobile phone than, than anyone else here uh, you get bored or is it too difficult or you have some post that you need to check who liked it who commented on it or something <laughs> you see we want distraction fine that's there. Are, there's a break. You want, you can have a look at your posts, but then if you keep distracting yourself, the exam performance will not be as good as you know your your, your tuition fee. You pay a good tuition fee, but you want a good mark as well. I think uh, take this into account, guys. It's my honest honest um, advise you is get the value out of the money you paid. Um, and uh, I'm sorry to single you out because I mean in front of everyone but everyone knows it I guess because I see them looking at you while you're looking at your screen so it just gives them a reason one reason that they should also do the same thing Wait, if they, what are you talking about? I mean the, looking at the mobile phone for a long time I mean you can look at it for a minute but you keep going at it for a, for a 10, 10 minutes sometimes 